turn to John chapter 8, John's Gospel, the 8th chapter. And as we get to what I really have come to appreciate is one of the most tender, uh, the most grace-filled stories uh, found in the entire New Testament of all the personal instances where Jesus meets someone in the midst of where they are in life. Uh, I think this one kind of stands almost at the pinnacle of that personal space where Jesus is just right in the middle of it. You all know it as the story of the woman who's caught in the very act of adultery. And as we gather today, while I'm fairly certain that I, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, that there probably are some in this room that maybe that sin has been in your life. Maybe it is today. But whether that's the case or whether the case is simply you're someone who struggles with anger, Maybe you're habitually bitter. Uh, perhaps you're a greedy person. There is some reason still yet today for you to be flung at the feet of Jesus. Even though you're believers by and large in this room, we still desperately, daily need the grace of God. Amen? Amen. This woman finds the grace of God in the depths of her need. And so as we turn our attention, uh, let's pick up in verse 1, but before we do, would you pray with me? Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for this incredible picture of your grace as it's contrasted to the law. Lord, we are all condemned by the law. Every one of us stumbles at some point in something. Many of us, so many times, we could hardly even imagine them being counted. But God, we need your grace. We need your mercy. And we thank you that it is available to all who ask. Lord, we put this now in your hands, your mighty word. Speak to us as your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This contrast, and we're going to see a series of them here in John 8, and in this case, between grace and the law. You see, by the works of the law, the Apostle Paul said, is no flesh, no one, no person ever going to be justified. The law never had the capacity to save anyone. All the law could do was prove to us exactly how far separated we are from God. And so the law really just simply defines the chasm that exists between us and God. And for some, perhaps that chasm is excruciatingly wide and very deep. For some, maybe it is a little less so. For some, maybe you're pretty good at restraining your own flesh by the works of the flesh, just simple strength and willpower. But none of us is able to bridge that chasm completely by our own self-action. We are all desperately in need of the one way, the one truth, the one life, the one offer of grace that's available to all who would believe Every one of us will be judged by the law as guilty, and every one of us needs the only remedy, Jesus Christ, the bearer of grace. And so it is here in this passage that we see grace magnified. As Pastor Chuck was famous for saying, if you're going to err, err on the side of grace. Verse 1, John 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and remember the Mount of Olives is to the east of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Temple Mount actually sits kind of in a small valley, but to the east, just less than a half mile away, is the summit of the Mount of Olives, and adjacent to that on the backside during this day and time was the house that Jesus could most often be found at. We'll see it in John chapter 11. It's the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so there in Bethany, next to Bethpage, on the backside of the mount, 
is where Jesus kind of spent his time when he was in the region. He often slept there and probably ate some meals there. So he's going to walk maybe uh, at less than a quarter of a mile to the Mount of Olives, and it would be there that he would normally spend the morning hours in prayer. We find him there often. The Garden of Gethsemane is found on the lower slopes of that mountain. But Jesus is going to go where he always went, first to meet with God the Father. And now early in the morning, he came again to the temple. So he's going to make that little half-mile journey from up on the mountain, down into the Kedron Valley, and around probably the southern steps, and then into the temple compound. And so Jesus is now going back to the temple. And remember, this all transpires during a feast week. The Feast of Tabernacles is now ended. And so there's still all of this busyness that's going on around the temple. And it is there that we find Jesus... And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees, now remember the scribes are those who would keep track of such things as uh, judicial appointments and laws, things that went on within the Jewish community. If it needed to be recorded, perhaps it would be a contract between two people uh, involving animals. Maybe it would be something... Uh, that was, we would call a commentary on the, on the Torah. They would write those things. So the scribes and the Pharisees, those who were the legalists of their day, are gathered together, and they now are going to come and confront Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, a Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, while I would believe and hope and pray that that's a fairly rare occurrence in in any circumstance or situation, we have all been caught in sin. We have all fallen and short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen? There is none righteous among us, no, not one. And so we're all in the same boat. And so while we're quick to say, oh, my goodness caught in the act of adultery. How hideous is that? I mean, how immoral must this woman have been? Let me caution you. We don't actually know her life story. We're not told. We have no idea how she ended up in this circumstance or situation. We don't know, perhaps maybe she was a widow left with young children. We don't know her history. All we know is that from a very limited perspective, this woman was caught in a sinful act. And that's clear. Jesus does not deny the fact that she's a sinner and that she was caught in that sin. Brothers and sisters, every last person in here before a holy God is in exactly the same place. Maybe not for the same reason, and I pray not for the same reason, but are you that person who won't let go of the past and hangs on to hatred? Are you that person who is habitually angry with everyone about everything? Perhaps you're here today and you are greedy. Maybe when you drive by in and out you can't resist the second double-double. <laughs> and you're saying, Jeff, you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, for a reason. Because like it or not, the Bible says, let me sin. Did you hear what I said? You see, we're quick to condemn the adulteress. But what about our addiction to Twinkies? You see, when you need grace, you want grace for your Twinkies. But are you willing to give grace to the adulteress? You see, because that which you need, you should be ready, willing, and able to give. And we see Jesus respond exactly 
how you and I need to have him respond to our weaknesses and failures and faults. And now Moses in the law, you see the law gets drug out. Aren't we quick to go, have you ever been guilty of quoting a Bible verse so that you can beat someone with it? You guys wouldn't do that, right? We all have our little proof text, don't we? I can't tell you how many times I've been in a marital counseling situation and I will hear, a man who doesn't provide for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. And a contentious woman is as a dripping faucet. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I I'm making no case for either being okay. I'm simply saying we all have our stuff. Amen? We're all guilty before the law. But notice how the law itself responds. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. And he wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. I just love this picture. You can almost see the gears turning in the Son of God. Oh, this is going to be rich. <laughs> Wait until they see what I write in the dirt. You can almost imagine, because he knows what he's going to do for this woman. He is going to release her from the bondage of sin. He's going to set her free. And so he stoops down and he begins to write and pretends he's not hearing what they have to say. And it is because he's not appearing to hear, so they continued asking him. And he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. You see, every last one of us deserves to be thrown on our face before Jesus. Every last one of us, myself included, you see, because I'm going to drive home after third service, and I'm going to go down PCH, and there's that one guy that has twice jumped out in front of my truck. And I'm moving. And the moment I see him on the side of the curb, and I know there's something not okay with him, I'm going to go, don't you do it. Don't you, I, I'll run you over. <laughs> I'm not stopping this time. No, you have those moments where it doesn't go right, amen? Can I ask you a little question? If you were a cartoon character, would you want those little thought balloons popping up over your head? <laughs> you, you see, God sees all those things. God hears those things. You don't have to speak them. He knows them. So before you get out the doors... There might be something in your head, your heart, your mind. Maybe you're thinking about work tomorrow and that person in your office that just needs to be put in their place. <laughs> you see, you're going to get tossed at Jesus' feet for that in this particular context. You're guilty. You got anger. You got bitterness. There's a little hatred in there. So be careful. You see, she was guilty. But the law required that the person who brings the accusation must be there when the punishment is carried out. And they have to be the one to cast the first stone. Jesus is quoting the law right back to him. He's judging the judges. Saying, okay, if you guys think you're okay. I almost imagine that he picked up a stone and said, here, anybody want it? And again he stooped down and wrote in the ground. 
And then those who heard it being convicted by their own conscience. I love this. Went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even unto the last. And then Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one but the woman was there, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is one of the most tender, grace-filled passages found in our Bibles. And while there's a bit of controversy whether it belongs here, let me tell you why that controversy primarily exists. In about the third century, uh, Augustine and those who followed him saw so much grace in this passage that they almost believed that it was an excuse to allow adultery. It was so clear this woman was being dismissed with there being no penalty. that they removed this particular passage. And so the transition between the 52nd verse of chapter 7 and chapter 12, or verse 12 of chapter 8, was a giant hole. It didn't make any sense. And so I believe this passage not only belongs here, it's a perfect illustration of what follows. And in fact, Jesus himself is going to be threatened with stoning before we get to the end of the chapter. So this transition is for you and me. It's an illustration of your life and my life. It's what would happen to you. It's what would happen to me. And in that case, it's a story of opposites. Between God's unbelievable forgiveness and our sinfulness. Anybody in here glad that we serve a forgiving God? Hallelujah. Amen. You see, legalism isn't so thankful for the forgiveness of others. Legalism says, well, I should be forgiven, but not them. Because I'm a little closer to God's character and nature, so naturally he would forgive me. Can I tell you, your Bible does not teach that doctrinally. It simply says that we're all in the same boat, paraphrasing. We've all sinned. We've all ended up short of the glory of God. Every last one of us left to our own devices, standing before a holy God. Whether you miss it by this much or this much, you're going to miss it. And so he provides the one thing that bridges the gap for every one of us. Whether you're here today and you were once formerly, as the Apostle Paul declared of his own self, I was formerly a blasphemer. Maybe you have the same problem this poor woman had. Maybe you can't keep your hands out of someone else's cookie jar. Or maybe you just can't tell the truth. You see, we're quick to judge which sins should be judged. And when there are sins, what do we want? Mercy, Lord! Don't give me what I've earned. Because that would mean judgment. You see, we cry out for His grace. We say, don't give me what I've earned. Give me what I have not earned. Because none of us can earn the grace of God. Amen? Yeah. And so this story is a story of opposites. It's a picture of how grace is the answer to the problem that's presented by the law. The law just presents this problem to us. It says, look, we, we've got an issue. Can I tell you before a holy God, I've got an issue. Anybody else in here got an issue before a holy God? I've got an issue before a holy God. I still have an issue before a holy God. Praise God for the grace of God that covers my issues. 
Don't miss what I'm saying here. If you're here today and you think you don't have issues, you have issues. <laughs> That's an issue all by itself. It's called pride. Because none of us can stand before a holy God in our own flesh. If the blood of Christ had not cleansed me from all unrighteousness, if my sins had not be bur had been buried in the depths of the sea, if I was not going one way, and the, and the sins that I created the other way, then, then I wouldn't be able to be with God ever. But he's taken care of that by putting his own son on Calvary's cross. And so grace is the answer to the law. This whole story to me sounds and smells like a setup. And this is what legalists do. Legalists are always about pulling out their proof text. But it's always interpreted in such a way as to benefit their conclusion. Well, the law says we should stone her. No, actually what the law says is you better go find the guy that she was in bed with and bring him here right now because we need to stone him too. That's what the law said. And furthermore, you better bring those who are accusers and have them stand right here after you go get the guy so that whoever's going to make the accusation better be clear before the Lord themselves so they can cast the first stone. Do you see the misinterpretation of the law? Prejudiced in such a way as to make it look like they were being holy? Well, Moses said, Be careful, brothers and sisters, about using the phrase, Thus says the Lord. You better be accurate. Because that judgment, Jesus said, with which you judge others, you yourself in like measure will also be judged. You see, this is the setup. They're trying to catch Jesus. Give you a little secret? Don't try and catch Jesus. It won't work out well for you. Amen? So here's this poor woman. She's tossed down at the feet of Jesus. She's broken. She's hurting. She doesn't need to be flung on the ground. She needs to be lifted up and given hope. She already knows her life's a mess. There, was, I, there is no doubt in my mind that she already knew her life was a mess. You know, I can tell you after... A lot of decades of ministry, most people already know their lives are a mess. What they're looking for is the answer. They're looking for hope. But legalism doesn't offer hope. It offers more condemnation, generally speaking. Because there is no hope apart from Christ himself. And so this woman, on her face... Somebody's screaming in her ear, look, here she is. I would fare no better. I would fare no better. Yeah, maybe my sin would look different. Maybe it would smell different. Maybe it would be named different. But sin is sin in the eyes of a holy God. And all sin separates. So every last one of us, without the grace of God, is separated from God. This woman needed grace. Instead, she's being set up by a prejudiced legalism that selectively chooses who's going to be stoned. Let me just say to you, we all deserve to be stoned. 
We all deserve to die. We all deserve to pay the price for our own sin. That's what we deserve. But praise God, the grace of God doesn't give us what we deserve. It gives us what we don't deserve. Amen? Heaven. Think about it. Think about this woman who's now on the, her face before Jesus, and she knows she's a mess. She, of course, was subject to arrest. This is, this is an arrestable offense. But what does Jesus do? He begins to judge the judges. I love this. You see, because he came not into the world to condemn the world, because the world through sin was already condemned, but he came that the world might be saved. So when Jesus meets this woman... He said, I didn't come to tell you that you were a mess. You were a mess before I ever got here. I came to tell you that you can be an unmess. You can be saved. But you see, that prejudice towards who she was. I'd be careful. Because we're prone to prejudice. As human beings, we like to pick and choose. We like to kind of decide what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in our own eyes. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen what Jesus wrote? I don't know what he wrote. Nobody does. It's not recorded. But I can only imagine. And it must have been really good. Because one by one, Levi, you were with her last week. <laughs> Andrew, why did you beat your wife last night? James, you really shouldn't have stolen that loaf of bread from the market last week. We don't know what he wrote. But we know the result. Maybe you reminded them, hey, the last time I did this, I did it in stone and it's inside the Ark of the Covenant. We don't know. <coughs> but we know what the law says. The accuser should have been there. He wasn't. And we know what happened to every last person who was involved in this situation one by one. They all got up and they hoofed it. <laughs> they said, oops. Sorry. Can I tell you, Jesus knows all your stuff too? And if he wanted to, he could kneel down and write your stuff in the dirt too. But he doesn't do that. He came that you would be freed of that dirt. Doesn't need to be scratched in the soil. Nobody needs to know about it, and in fact, so much so is that the truth that he remembers not your transgressions. As far as the east is from the west, he buries them in the depths of the sea so that they cannot be seen. They are effectively behind his back. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen? Because I've given him a pile of stuff in my lifetime to write in that dirt. And I'm guessing so of you. That's the power of the word to convict us. And all he says to her, acknowledging the fact that she's wrong, he doesn't say, well, you, you never sinned, so I don't know what the problem is here. He says exactly what you would expect if he's issuing grace to her. Go and sin no more. The same thing he said to the man at the pool of Bethesda, by the way. Go and sin no more. Pick up your bed, rise, walk, go and sin no more. You see, the expectation of the glorification of man through the forgiveness of God is that we go and sin no more. That's the expectation. That means this conviction was genuine. This woman understood what had been done for her. And she was now going to begin to walk away from that, 
legalism. She would, she would begin to experience this incredible forgiveness. And that forgiveness was not cheap. It was not tawdry. It, it wasn't that Jesus was excusing what she had done. But Jesus was acknowledging, I know you, how you ended up in this place. I, I know the, the town that you lived in. I, I, I was there when you were abused when you were 10. I know this didn't happen to you, sister, in a vacuum. I know why your life is like this. And if you're willing to forsake it, I'm willing to forgive it. You see, because there is no forgiveness until there's conviction. You've got to be convicted that there's a problem. It's from there that there's conversion. And she recognized, man, I'm a mess, and I need Jesus. And so he imparts grace to her and just simply says, rise and walk and sin no more. That's why Romans 3.20 is so important to us, for by the deeds of the flesh, no one is justified in his sight. For by the law is simply the knowledge of sin. But by grace we've been saved, as Paul would write to the church at Ephesus. Through faith, and that, not of yourself, not of me, it's not of you, it's a gift. And so she begins to walk in three new realities. And I want you to see these things. She now understands her sin can be forgiven. Think about it. Jesus did not mention her past. He didn't look at her and go, wow, you're really a case. <laughs> Whew, you have any idea what I just did for you? My goodness, I've never seen anybody that's so rotten as you. No, he just forgave her. Brothers and sisters, that is how God treats all of us when we repent. We say, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm asking you to forgive me. She didn't need to fear the judgment day. You see, as a Jewish woman, she was convicted under Jewish law. No doubt she was a Jewish woman. She had a lot of fear in her life. She woke up every day, I wonder when I'm going to get caught. I wonder when I'm going to have to pay the price for what I've been doing. But now, payment was made. She was walking in freedom. She'd never face the future the same. She wouldn't ever have to walk around with her head down wondering if she took her last breath waiting for the next day of atonement so possibly her sins could be assuaged. She was free right then and right there. And because of that, she now has a new life story. I'm going to ask the band to come back out. They're going to lead us in a closing song, but I want to leave you with these six things. They're very simple. You see her fall? It was my fall. It's also your fall. The fall is sin. The fall that Adam and Eve undertook in the garden is still our lot. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? So in that sense, we're all fallen. Every one of us would have been on our face before a holy God. In need of repentance. And now by grace we can stand. Amen? But her fear, what she was afraid of, is the same thing that still cause people fear today. <laughs> I wonder who knows about me. I, I wonder when I'm going to get caught. I wonder when I'm going to be, be exposed for who I really am. You see, Jesus doesn't capitalize on your fears. He takes away your fears. Amen? He, he removes that fear. He, he takes that life that you used to live. 
that, that life of guilt and shame. And he says, you're my child now. You don't need to walk in that guilt anymore. You have nothing to be ashamed of because I paid for that. Her friend, can you imagine when she saw Jesus, how she felt about Jesus from this day forward? That's the man that rescued me. I was about to be put to death and he stepped in and came to my defense. Is that crazy? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came to the defense of this woman who was guilty. That's real love, family. That's real love. You see, real love steps in when it's dirty and dangerous. Real love gets in. Jesus had every reason to go, oh, please get her away from me. But instead he got down on his knees and he said, I love you. Pick your chin up. Her faith. There's no evidence she did a thing in this story except be tossed at the feet of Jesus. That's it. She didn't get up and do anything. She got up a new creation in Christ Jesus and behold, old things are passing away. Amen? Amen. She just received it. She believed it. She walked in faith. And her forgiveness, think about this. She had not ever known this type of forgiveness. Ever. She walked around in that fear and she walked around in that guilt believing she was condemned. That at any moment someone could grab her and they could take her to the scribes and the Pharisees and she was a dead woman. Now she's walking around as a daughter of the king. Oh yeah, there was stuff that was going to be in her life for the rest of her days that were the consequences of some of her actions, but she was forgiven. Forgiven. Are you walking in that forgiveness today? Would you stand with me? You see, because the picture of this woman is the picture of every last one of us who today is in Christ. Because our future is bright, amen? And every day is a new day. Because behold, I'm making all things new, amen? Not some things, all things. And the old things, what this woman was 15 minutes before, was a part of her past. And she now has a new future. I want to ask you today, is there something keeping you from walking in that new future that you're supposed to have in Christ Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you're saying right now, Jeff, I'm, I'm struggling. I got stuff going on in my life and I'm not proud of it and I want to lay it down right now because I've allowed the enemy to get into my life and he's beating me up with this junk and you want to be free to that right now I want you to raise your hand just put your hand up I want to pray with you nobody needs to know what it is because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords already knows he could write it in the dirt he's not going to but he's asking you by faith to put your hand up and believe that he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that you could ask or think he'll do it just put your hand up I want to pray with you praise the Lord you know that's all this woman had to do was be honest before Jesus we're gonna pray in a moment now if you're here today and you can honestly say I don't know if I even know Jesus and you want to know him as your personal Lord and Savior, you want to take that first step of faith, put your hand up right now. Anybody at all? I see that hand in the back. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? You want to receive Jesus Christ 
He's waiting for you to say yes to his offer of grace. Put your hand up right now. Thank you, Lord. And see that hand. And that hand in the back. And that hand in the back as well. Hallelujah. Family, would you pray with those that have lifted their hands? Heavenly Father, we just come to you in need of your grace. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus died on Calvary's cross to redeem us, to buy us back, to set us free from the bondage of sin and death. And for these that have raised their hands first, because they're struggling. Lord, would you take their struggles and turn them into triumphs? Would you take their losses and turn them into victories? Lord, would you take their bondage and set, set them free, Lord? God, whatever it is that has bound them up, Lord, they are bound up in something. And you know exactly what it is. We ask that you would bind the work of the enemy in the name of Jesus by the blood of the cross. That you would forgive them, Lord, for those transgressions. And Lord, now for those that have decided today is a day of salvation, would you pray with me these words? Heavenly Father, thank you for the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive my sin and cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Please write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I want to walk with you all of my days. Lord, I thank you right now for saving me. And as you have done this, I am offering my life up to you. Please be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.